Hello everyone, this is John Buck, back with another video in my array signal processing series. Uh, and in this video, we're going to talk about something very be, uh, important in array signal processing, which is Capon's Minimum Variance Distortionless Response Beamformer. Uh, that's a mouthful, so we often just call it by its initials, MVDR, uh, which, or sometimes it's just called the Optimal Beamformer because under certain conditions, it's often the best beamformer or optimizes certain performance metrics. Uh, so let's switch over to the whiteboard and I'll show you how we derive it and, and, and talk a little bit about how to interpret it. So the idea for the MBDR beamformer is to assume in, a, in its simplest form we have some signal of interest coming in that's uh, a plane wave. We're, we'll start from this, though it doesn't have to be a plane wave, but just that we know the array manifold of the desired signal V0, and then there's some amplitude we're looking for in that direction, plus some noise. And we're going to, but we're not going to assume the noise is white anymore. So this is our noise term. But we're going to assume that this vector is zero mean still, but it, it, it's some complex Gaussian with zero mean, but that it has some spatial covariance matrix like we saw before the break, S of n. So that's not necessarily not, so I should make clear, this is not necessarily just the white noise case. And then this is our, our signal term. And what we assume about this is that V0, the array manifold, is deterministic, right? We know what it is. We know where we're looking. This is sort of where, where we're looking, but we don't necessarily know what the amplitude is. We might be trying to detect something or estimate something. And, and we'll assume that A, this amplitude, which is a scalar, is also a scalar complex Gaussian with zero mean and some variant sigma a squared. But the main thing for deriving capon is just that we know this thing is deterministic, so we're going to see we want to set the gain to be one in that direction. So we're really thinking of this as a signal plus a noise, and then so for our beamformer, right, our beamformer output y is the inner product of the array weights with the observed vector x. And so we could think of this as a superposition, right? We could say, well, this is really going to be the sum. The weights are going to get applied to both of these terms, the sum of these two things. This noise might be background noise. It might also be other interferers, we'll see. We could, we could consider it as, as other terms we want to get rid of. And so when we do this, we're going to, if we multiply that through, We'll have that scalar A we can pull out front. We'll have W Hermitian times V naught plus W Hermitian N. And so our goal in having a good beam form is we say, well, you know, we want the weights in this direction to have a gain of one. We want to say, you know, for the things that are coming from the V naught direction, we want this gain here. Whereas what's left over here we want to minimize the power coming out or the variance. We want to minimize this is everything else. So we minimize the variance of that term, right? Which is also the same as saying I want to minimize the uh, expected value of the power at that output. So if we do that, I could write this out and say, well, this is the expected value of W Hermitian N times its conjugate, which becomes N Hermitian W. Right? These two terms are the conjugates of each other. Multiplying them gives me the magnitude squared. So if I do that, I'll say this is, I can then say, well, the weights are, are what we're going to compute here. And so the only thing that's random is the n inside. So I could say that this is W Hermitian times the expected value of n n Hermitian times W. But this thing in the middle we've seen before too. This is the spatial covariance of the noise, which we often call S sub capital N. Right? This is the spatial covariance of the noise, or the spatial covariance matrix 
of the noise term. And so we'd like to minimize this thing here under the constraint that we have to have a gain of 1 here. Without the constraint, it's a silly problem, right? If I don't have a constraint here, I can just say, well, set w equal to 0. And that minimizes the noise, right? You get 0 out. But that's not a useful beamformer because I get nothing out. So the, I, I say I want to get as little of this noise energy out subject to the constraint that I want a gain of 1. I want my spatial filter to have a gain of 1 for signals coming from the v naught direction. So let's see how we set that, that. We say, oh, that's starting to sound kind of Lagrangey. Maybe we need to set up an optimization problem. So let's uh, turn the page and set that up as a Lagrange problem. OK, so now if we look at this, in, Lagra in terms of the Lagrange problem, we're gonna, what we want to do is we want to choose that array weight vector w to minimize this quadratic form, w Hermitian s sub n w, subject to the constraint the W Hermitian V naught equals 1, which is this is the beam pattern in my desired look direction, and I want that to have a gain of 1. I want the beam pattern to be 1 for signals coming from my desired location. Uh, and then we want to minimize the result of everything else. We want to find the array weights that do the best job, of, we'll see, of uh, suppressing discrete interferers, loud, annoying things that are coming at us, and overall balancing that with uh, attenuating or averaging the overall background noise, the uncorrelated part. So let's set this up, and more formally, we say here's our constraint, here's our thing we want to minimize, so let's define the functional, we'll call it J here. Right, so this is the thing we want to minimize, and we know when we're, remember, uh, when we're working with these complex vectors we saw earlier, we treat W Hermitian and W like they were completely separate from each other. They have no relationship to each other, and then uh, we take the gradient with respect to one of them or the other, and we'll get to the right answer. Uh, but to do that, we also have to incorporate the constraint, or two times the real part of the constraint, which we usually do, is, is the constraint plus its conjugate. So let's add those terms in. Okay, so these two terms here are two times the real part of the constraint, where this gamut is our Lagrange multiplier, our dummy variable for the Lagrange multiplier. So we want W Hermitian V0 minus 1 to be equal to 1, uh, our w Hermitian v naught to be equal to 1, so we set it up this way. And then we take the conjugate of this term, and that's like having the v naught and wh switch places, so I'm taking the conjugate transpose of v instead in this one, and conjugate of 1 is 1. So now my next step is to take the gradient with respect to, I'll, I'll do w Hermitian here. Again, I can do either one of j and set it equal to 0, and then Right, this is the same same old story for Lagrange over and over again, and then solve <clears throat> for W. And once we've done that, we'll also need to plug in to the constraint equation to get gamma. So let's see how this plays out. So the first step, when we take the, the derivative with respect to W Hermitian, pretending W Hermitian and W are not the same thing conjugate transpose. It's just this, this mathematical process or trick we use to uh, find gradients in the complex space and, and get to the right answer without having to go through complicated breaking it into real and imaginary parts and, and all that. Uh, so when we do that, if we take the gradient with respect to W Hermitian of J, I'll get S sub N of W, right? I take this one and the gradient goes away from that, plus I'll have a gamma times this first term, so I'll have a gamma v naught, and over here there are no W Hermitian, so this one goes to zero, so I've got this whole thing set to zero. And now if I want to solve this for W, uh, I'm going to move this, the constraint term, to the right hand side, so I have S sub n, the matrix, times W, is minus gamma, which is a scalar, times v naught. And I'm going to multiply both sides by S sub n inverse. So I multiply by the inverse of the spatial covariance matrix of the noise. I'm going to leave that gamma out front. So I have minus gamma. I can pull that out front because it's a scalar, so it doesn't worry about the order of multiplication the way the matrices do. So I have the inverse, left multiplied by the inverse of the spatial covariance of the noise times V naught minus gamma. So that's the form of my solution here. 
Now I need to come back up to the constraint equation to solve for what gamma is. I need to put this in for w up here and figure out uh, what w is, what gamma is. So let's start on the, a clean page for that. Okay, so solving to solve for gamma, we're going to say we know w has this form. We know basically this is saying this is a vector times a matrix, right? Well, the inverse of a matrix. So this whole thing will be a vector. That tells us which direction is pointed in. We just need to know how much to scale it by. We need to figure out gamma, we figure out how to scale it by. So this is about the unity gains part. It makes sense. We know which, what the array weights should be. We just have to normalize them appropriately. And we want to normalize them to con satisfy this constraint that W Hermitian V naught equals one, right? So that's, if I get my pointer here, that's this equation right here. I'm going to start by doing one of these annoying things professors do, knowing what answer we're going to, we want to get to, uh, which is I'm going to take the conjugate right away of this. Say, well, if this equation is true, so is its conjugate. So we can rewrite this if I take the conjugate of an inner product by switching the two around and taking their conjugates. So V naught becomes V Hermitian, and V W Hermitian becomes W, and one's conjugate is one. And remember, again, this V naught, just to remember, this is the manifold vector for the desired look direction, right? So this is the manifold or replica of the steering direction. All right, so now I'm going to take this expression for W and plug it in here. So I get V naught Hermitian times minus gamma SN inverse times V naught. And all that equals one. Right, so I can now, uh, well, again, this is a, a scalar, so I can pull it out in front and I get minus gamma V naught Hermitian S inverse V naught equals one. So now I can solve for gamma, this scalar, because this thing here is a quadratic form, which means it's a scalar too. So I can just divide both sides by this number, well, minus this number, and I'll get the gamma is equal to minus one over V naught Hermitian S sub N inverse V naught. So I've got this quadratic form of the uh, look direction, uh, manifold vector, with the uh, SN inverse, the noise spatial covariance inverse. So if I put that all together, right, if I go back to my previous page, so I'm going to put that in for gamma, the two minus signs will cancel out when I plug in here. And I'll be left with a solution for W that looks like this. Oh, need to make myself a little more space to write here. Let me scoot up a little bit. And now when I plug that in, well, again, I'm plugging into here for gamma, and what I get looks like this. We end up with this SN spatial covariance noise inverse times V naught divided by V naught SN inverse V naught. Uh, and we often write it this way just by representing uh, this, this denominator is just a constant scaling factor. So the numerator tells us about the relative magnitudes and phases, right? Remember, everything in beamforming, especially narrow band beamforming, is about how I'm going to scale each element and how I'm going to phase or shift it relative to the others. So the, the ma relative magnitudes and phases are already in the numerator. The denominator is just the gain I apply to make sure that when I have the look direction, I get one and not two or a half or three quarters or whatever. It's easy to see that though. Um, but again, so this alpha is just a gain factor. So sometimes to emphasize that this SN inverse V naught is the, where the action is, uh, we'll often write this out just as a constant alpha out front. That's the scaling factor for unity gain. That looks like this. Just to re partly because it just it's, it's simpler to write this alpha if we're going to be carrying it around a lot than writing this over and over again. But so these are very important. These are the array weights for the minimum variance distortionless response beamformer. So I don't do that often, but it's an important enough beamformer. I'm going to put a red box around all of this. In fact, most of the second half of the class, we'll be talking about understanding how this works and what we have to do in practice because we often don't know the ideal S or we have to compensate for other forms of imperfections in our knowledge. Okay, so that's our derivation, starting from the idea that we want to have a gain of one in a certain look direction.
and then we're going to have as much variance as possible, or as minimize the variance as much as possible for everything else, we end up with this set of array weights. Now, in, it's important to mention, in real life, we don't know where things are coming from. What would actually happen in real life is we'd have a whole bunch of these working in parallel for different v naughts, right? We would be looking at, at many different direct. We'd have a grid of different directions, sort of the same way when I want to find a, a spectrum in the time domain, I can't compute the Fourier transform at one frequency. I compute it at many different frequencies. In beamforming, I won't compute the array weights just for one look direction, right? I'll be doing a scanned response with a whole bunch, a grid of different v naughts spanning the region I'm, I'm interested in, usually from n fire to n fire. So it's important to remember in practice, we're doing this for each direction in parallel to get our MBDR beamformer. And we'll say more about that in class two. So I'm going to stop here uh, and, and we'll follow up more on how do we interpret this and understand what the beamformer is doing in class. I'll uh, see you then. Bye. Have a good, see you next time.